So you've got the material, the space. Take a composer like Sibelius, for instance. Um, he clearly uh, had an idea of material where music was, where the actual material dictated the space which it went, which it finally occupied. And uh, I know that a lot of us think that this is true, that uh, a good piece is one in which the clock time or the various forms of perceptual time which a piece contains um, are in some way adequate to or adequated by uh, the actual material and what the material does in any given measure. And one of the, one of the main ideological roots of what I, I did in the 80s was I tried to think of time as a, not just as a space within which things could happen, but as a natural parameter equal to um, any form of polyphonic voice leading. And my thesis was that uh, time needs to be audible. In other words, if you try to make time disappear into the material and the processes, you're, you're playing a clever game, but you, what you really need is for time to expose itself or be exposed uh, during the actual listening. So, uh, in one article I wrote about time being heard crawling over the top of your head sometimes. And this is something that's always been, for the last 30 years, something which has been very important to me. And so, this passage guide was one piece in which I set out to render spaces which are determined in one particular way and instruments and rhythms and pitches which are determined in different ways to render them together so as to see um, what is the degree of adequation, what is the, uh, yes, I suppose adequation is the word, um, what does material do in that space to, to convince us that it fills the space adequately, or if it doesn't, what does time do to us when it's left over? Or perhaps time isn't long enough for a particular thing to happen. And of course, we always assume that time and material are organic processes, and that there are natural boundaries which unite these things with the human fuses. But at the same time, I was very interested in what happens if something is too short or too long. And what I did was, I set out first of all to make a, a measure scheme. This measure scheme was completely arbitrary and abstract. I worked on a if-then <coughs> computer model, a random <coughs> computer model, in which certain sorts of measures occurred more often in the context of other measures. So it wasn't entirely arbitrary. But the point was that I played then no role in, as far as taste was concerned, in changing that measurement. So we've got that. This is so far not so different from what I do otherwise. Then I sat down and worked out a 20 layer ryth rhythmic model which used five different types of registering the basic proportions which I had chosen in rhythmic form. So um, it was rather like a, a rhythmic harmony, if you like. Every measure um, was determined by the type of ratios uh, which came before it, and it anticipated in large measure the things that came after it. So what I ended up with was a, oh, I don't know how many pages there were, 180 pages or something, of rhythmic structures written out four by four. So the, the first four were based upon the same principle, but uh, using the numbers available in different ways. The same is true of the second, third, fourth, and fifth. And as they went down, they became, became more arcane. That is, they were no longer um, obvious correlates to, let's say, the measure structure. And I'll maybe give you an example in a moment. And so they became, to that extent, um, 
I won't say less logical, but I use them less, I think, in general. Um, for instance, if I take a, let's say I take a main structure. Just for a moment. Could be anything. Um, this has been given to me in the first process that I've worked through. Now, one of the layers, or four, four of the layers in this case, um, of the actual rhythmic structuring would in some way reflect the relationship between these measures. So that um, I could say here, okay, the 3 8 measure has four subdivisions. Because it's followed by a 4 8 measure. The 4 8 um, has two subdivisions, the 2 8 has five subdivisions. You can say this is extremely arbitrary, but in fact, I think it's not. And the 5 8 is 3, so it's 6 and 5. Uh, one thing that this does is it allows you in the long term to predict what will follow. Uh, any particular measure's contents. So if we see the two here, we'll know that it's a five that follows it. We don't know that, of course, as listeners, but my point is here, unlike serial composers who maintain that um, there is some inherent logic in uh, the one to 12 sort of order and you can, you can fit rhythms to them and pitches and so on, um, I do not believe that those things are audible. They produce some very interesting pieces, but you, you couldn't listen to the piece on that basis. For instance, um, Milton Babbitt used to write with eight, so eight layers of, of pitch structure. And I don't have perfect pitch, but I know a lot of people who do. And, you know, they don't sit there waiting for that final E flat of the eighth layer. <laughs> and if they do, what? What? What do we know about the music? So I'm trying to... Um, fractalize, as it were, the experience of major spaces by giving us something on which is translated on a different basis of our perception. If I have a 3-8 followed by 4-8, that empty is going to be a quality. It's the ratio of 3 to 4. If, however, I fill it then with pulses, that's going to be a quite different way of listening to things uh, because the larger, as we know with serial music, the larger the number, or two related numbers, the less likely we are to perceive the ratio. If you have one to two, it's fine. But if you have 10 to 11, it's not fine because you don't, uh, oral mechanisms do not assess those ratios in the same way. So at some point in between six and seven, I suppose, things break down. So my idea was here to provide a reality check, if you like, that when, if we assume we're working with wave motion and that the length of measures has something to do with waves, then by putting things into the measures which are translated into actual countable units, we are um, increasing our likelihood that we will be able to suspend disbelief, that we will, um, how shall I say, uh, there's a multiplication of the likelihoods of us being able, able to assimilate some of the actual materials. And of course, if you take a, se a second layer, Thank you. The hero there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here too, uh, and here five. This would happen to be the simplest layer because it wouldn't have any um, distinction between the subdivisions and the length of the measure. So by using these things as in a form of consistent rotation, I can actually change my perception of how these core values will add up together 
to provide a musical experience which is quite analogous to normal forms of musical experience. Um, in this particular piece, however, I deliberately set out to uh, change and question, not because this, is, this doesn't work, it does work, but um, I try to say, okay, assume this number of measures. Um, does what happens and what's given to me in the rhythmic patterning, does this in some way express that particular size of event? So we're moving down from 3, 4, 2, 5, we're moving down into, from ratios into pulse relationships, but if we go in the other, in the other direction, 3, 4, 2, 5 is a unit, uh, and 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 beat. And if, how do these things work? How do I choose which of these rhythms I use in terms of creating that sense of a 14-ness? And um, it may seem a little academic, but I'll come back to it later on. Other things that happen are uh, if you have these, then you can do something to the rhythmic structure such that uh, the original values will be reflected in what you do. So if I say... Space one, two, three, four, one, one, two, and so on. What I'm doing here is I'm omitting pulses uh, following the rule of three, four, two, five. So you play three, leave one out. Uh, you play four, leave one out, you play two, and then you leave one out in, in the measure after that. Um, quite often this will create characteristic measure-based figurations. I mean, in this case it's obvious, beam, bom, bom, beam, bom, 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 bom. And the opposite of that would be this. Okay, let, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take it further. Okay. Um, one, two, three, four. And so on. Um, what I'm doing here is I'm, instead of leaving pulses out, I'm doubling certain pulses. So almost anything can be used as a marker. You can use an instrumentation as a marker. Um, but in this case, I'm simply taking the result that I received on this level and uh, using the same numbers to... Um, Yes. Say. So I can um, create waveforms which intersect with each other, but in the simplest way, create um, replicas of each other in different um, perceptual domains. And how long have I been doing this? I think I started doing this at the very beginning of the 80s. In any case, my idea was that not that we would hear these things as such, but like internal music, um, certain things remain in the ear as assumptions, as real physical assumptions. And by trying to create alternative modes of using ratios of a very basic sort, you could also come up with larger larger sections of music, which in some ways are, are, are consistent. In some ways, however, um, you can make wildly inconsistent ones. <laughs>
And so this, I give you this only as a made-up thing. But let's say, using this particular setup here, I would write four lines like that. Uh, using this one here, I would write four lines using a rest procedure. And with this one, I would use, I would write four lines using an um, 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 additive value. So two values instead of one. And of course, once you start using numbers in that way, you can use them uh, quite well. Why did I choose two? Well, there was no reason. But it could have been I, I started, I, I turned that into a three, for instance, because we've got a three eight. In this one, I would have turned these two into four, because I, I, I've then got a four eight. So, you imagine that this Kutzli type is 20 layers of this sort of thing, from beginning to end of the piece. Some of the very lower levels are extremely complex in terms of not only um, adding values, but adding um, cells, which are themselves uh, related to the original pattern, so fractal sort of things. And I started using this quite early. I think it was in 83 that I first started realizing that one could evaluate original values in such a way that they would be aided, um, supported by things done on the inside of them. So you think of that as 20 layers. Of now, the next step for me, um, I, I emphasize first of all with, with this, that I am not, this is not what all appears in the piece. Uh, it is not serial music, it is a series of constraints and proposals and challenges which will then be used in the piece in, in whatever fashion seems to me appropriate. So the next stage was determining how many measures or beats would be contained in um, a particular section. So in Plutzli's guide, the reason, part of the reason that I'm using the title of Plutzli's guide is that um, the suddenness of much 19th century painting, Caspar uh, David Friedrich, for instance, uh, deals with this question of the sublime in art. And it's something that always, I always come back to in some way. So one's dealing with trying to find lengths. Let's say I've got here Okay, four, seven, two, five. These are the lengths of segments. And these were created in a very similar way to the measure structure. And they don't coincide with the measure structure. They sometimes run over a measure into the next measure. And these are arbitrary in the same way. And they force me to look at these units on the basis of these rhythmic patterns and the point in the piece I've arrived at, and also um, the instrumentation. Now, the instrumentation of this piece uh, is quite large. I use four of the basic woodwind. I use um, a bass trumpet. I use uh, six horns, four, three trumpets, four trombones, uh, um, two harps, tuning quarter tones, one of them is tuning quarter tones. So it's really quite a big, a big orchestral uh, apparatus. And I simply wrote down um, which instruments would appear in which part. So I might say flutes, they appear in those two. Uh, oboes appear only in the second. Um, bass clarinet. Strings. And so I get a list for each one of these small components. I get a list of instruments which uh, not only are permitted, but need to be used. And the order in which they occur in the sketch indicates the order in which they enter in that particular segment. It doesn't say anything else then that those instruments have to be used in that particular segment. There's one section, I think, only one section in the piece 
where a single instrument, um, a clarinet, is the only instrument playing in an entire segment. It plays a couple of notes. That's right. So all these things uh, are based upon the same principle of contextual continuity in terms of ratio relationships, but they're applied to different sub-values, uh, be it rhythmic structure, be it pulsation in a time space, be it the number of instruments performing, be it the length of space within which instruments occur. So th this piece was really one of the most important pieces for me in um, coming to terms with the issue of perspective. In other words, I know you shouldn't really use painting terms in music, but so uh, Perspective is the notional distance of the ear and perceiving mind from a musical object. And a musical object is then defined by our ability to analyze out the different contributions that are being made to that musical object. And we can then see which of those are more important, which have continuity from earlier segments, and so on. And all forms of music really have this. And so um, if I have, let's say, Yes, okay. Um, the beginning of a piece, for instance, I'm not sure it does in this case, the beginning of a piece may indeed use only uh, elements from the first four lines of this process. How do I choose them? Well, that's me as a composer. Um, I emphasize that I did, the creation of materials does not force me to use those materials. The creation of materials um, if, if, I, if I want to start breathing by holding my nose, that's my own choice, a very unwise choice, and it doesn't have anything to do with the quality of the air. And so, <laughs> on the basis of these four lines, which would then be uh, the sort of ur relationship of the metric structure to its, its uh, reflection in musical means, I would then... Um, determine how to use the instruments that occurred in this particular list here. And um, it was very funny, because this piece is a t piece of total discontinuity. Um, a critic came up to me once and said, um, I've listened to this piece five or six times now, and I'm beginning to see the overall shape. There isn't an overall shape. Well, it just shows that we over-educated people uh, project things from our own inner lives onto music and we can't do much about that. Uh, so, essentially, there is no, uh, no large-scale shape. I have 114 of these little boxes, ranging from total tutti down to just one instrument. And I am forced to use those at the exact point at which they occur in the scheme. But, for instance, well, let's say the flute is written at the top. Okay, I start with the flute. But where the uh, this instrument here occurs, that has to do with the structure of the pulsations and not with anything internal to this particular thing. So what you're seeing is a sort of structural disjunction which is being mediated by my feeling of unease at being forced to project my invention on these particular spaces with means available. And sometimes it's extremely constricting. And um, what I did also at the end of the piece, not at the end, but when, um, when I was working on it, I put in three little structures, which have nothing to do with the scheme. One was for brass, one was for strings, and one was for woodwind. Uh, I don't apologise for them. Stockhausen and Scrubbin did that too. He saw the, the shape of the piece, uh, according to his serial principles, didn't really add up to a, to a satisfactory conclusion. So he put in three very nice um, inserts. And so I did that. Uh, how that affects the 
the idea of the piece I don't know. All it can do is to offer a counter instance, I guess, because it clearly, uh, if you have a piece of insert which lasts 50 beats, and in those 50 beats you have a consistency of possible use of certain instruments, clearly that's going to make a big difference. But at the same time, when you're making up this material, you're taking into account the types of repetition that come in these patterns. There was um, one of the first pieces I, I, uh, in the 90s I did was called El Gebrara for um, Oboe and Strings, based upon the life of, of Adolf Lutli, the guy says to push it open. And that had at the top this particular way of working. Underneath that, it had what I called an iterative pattern. Let's say I get this. That's an iterative pattern. And it will appear in a measure uh, up to the point where the, where the measure cuts it off. So in this case, it would be 3 8, and you would get this. Yes, it just fits exactly. If a figure is of a length which exceeds the measure, then that version, the last version of the figure will be eliminated. And the computer was very useful in trying to work this one out. The third was the third layer. And to tell you the truth, I can't remember what it was now, but that's all right. It's um, the entire piece is based upon the interaction of these three types of quasi-iterative ratio relationships. For instance, I'll give you an example of this one. If I had um, I had one that came out like this. Uh, three, uh, five, and four in five. Uh, it obviously, by repetition, would not fit exactly into that measure. So the final version of it would be would be eliminated. And I found that worked quite well because um, the, uh, using iteration in music, and certainly in contemporary music, is a problematic issue. And I wanted ways of doing that. And um, this particular way of working with it seemed quite adequate. Although I'm not doing that here, um, mainly because the computer programs I had didn't work entirely as it was supposed to be. But I am using five different intensities and degrees of deconstruction of this basic original structure. And another thing I'm doing in this piece, so it's not as if it's totally out of the train, I said. Um, oh, that works, okay. Uh, I have a series of, I think, 37 prolational canons. So, um, and they're unusual prolational canons, because they start all at the same time. So, one, two, three, four. This one will go a certain space. This one will go a certain space. This and this. And at that point, the prolational canon version is concluded. And you start another one. So, I start all of these things with a bang, as it were, in the basic model. And the, the, these are somewhat I wouldn't say intuitive, but they do not follow the sticker scheme. So what I do is I say, okay, I'll do this. This follows the scheme, or some scheme. This one is in a ratio of 1 to 1.7, let's say. And it's longer. This one is in a ratio of two of 1 to 2.6. This one is a ratio of 1 to 3.1. And because I'm using these irrational ratios, uh, I have to find a way of notating the rhythms that occur in the basic version at those different tempi. And that was really quite difficult. And because it's not approximative in that sense, I'm not just saying, oh, well, this one's a bit longer and that one's a bit shorter. I'm actually trying to find rhythmic structures which do reflect those, those themes. And so all adding up together, you find there are quite, there's quite a large number
a, a mutually um, supportive uh, decision-making procedures in the piece, uh, which then allow me, in any given section, to try and create either a sense of satisfactory relationship between material and time, so we're still talking about time, or not. And I enjoy that particular sort of challenge. Let me see if I can find it. I'm not even sure I can now. I had it a little while ago. Here we are. Uh, Um, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit, um, not terribly good at this. Let me try again. Right, now. you can see that my, my degree of, of organizational acumen is not particularly applicable. Hmm, interesting. Uh, yes, yes, I should look, of course I should do it that way. Oh, here we are. Yeah, okay. But what I've done is the one in which the Sirtia. Yeah, that's Sirtia, thank you very much. I'll just play you a bit of this to give you a sense of 
So, um, some of you have noticed probably that the horns and the trumpets seem out of tune. Uh, they're supposed to be. The, I, I tuned the three trumpets in six of the turn, and there are six horns, and each two is tuned for six of the turn alone. You can get some very interesting things out of that, because the flat seventh, of course, is the sixth turn, and if you get the first horn to play his flat seventh, you just tune the second and the, the third four horns to that. And likewise for the fifth and the sixth, it works very well. Um, I wanted to say a couple of other things about it. One was that you'll probably have noticed that I use the human voice. There are three female voices. They are not amplified. They are not uh, in front of the orchestra. They're simply sitting in the orchestra. And that partly has to do with my... Uh, I was talking to you earlier on about the sublime. My idea of the unheimlich in um, perception. And it's certainly true that the human voice can shock us at times. And it also, there are large silences, and those large silences are also calculated, they're interpolated into these 114 sections. So, um, as in the, ancient, uh, the ancients would have said, as in the large, so in the small. And I tried to use similar principles in interlocking these various dimensions. Uh, without them being identical. I think that would have been a disaster. Um, as long as things are perceptibly uh, in some way similar or corresponding, uh, exact correspondence of values is not required. What's, what's required is a consistent way of observing these things on the part of the composer. And so um, that was that piece. Um, did you want to move on to something else? Right? Um, maybe just um, one tiny question. When I uh, interpret you right, there are different layers of organization which then interfere and make you, as a subject, as a composer, decide. So this is uh, forcing you to decide. Um, yes. Because it just it doesn't give you information and you could put an A here, a B here, and all, but uh, it forces this kind of constraints, force you to decide as a composer. Yes, so that's a very, a, a very technical aspect, mm -hmm. so that uh, the technique makes you decide and doesn't decide for you. Yes, that's right. I mean, I use these techniques because they give me a certain degree of overall consistency and consistency in thinking and relating to the materials. But when it comes to write the piece, um, it seems to me that once walking in a landscape and you do different things depending upon the ground and trees and the sunlight, you do different things according to the environment, and that's something which I try mm -hmm. to do. Yeah. And the second question: What you were talking about uh, about the instrumentation that there were there was in one um, place just one clarinet player. Yes. Yeah. This kind of let's say maximization or minimization yeah, is. Uh, do you think this as a kind of working on your uh, layers and materials, or is it a kind of what um, the German word would be uh, Durchführung or Bearbeitung? Or is, uh, or is it more a, a graduation of variability that some po at some point goes to, and which is, I think, a massive importance sometimes to zero, and sometimes to 144, or, or how many layers? Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, yes, I mean, uh, there's in principle no difference between uh, 10 violins and one clarinet. It depends on the material that you're using. Okay. Um, clearly, I'm only using one material at that point, although I could have used more. Uh, it's just an interesting problem what you do when this solo instrument suddenly appears. Mm -hmm. And it's only in the last part of the piece that this happens. So it's a very odd sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, maybe uh, I would suggest you to have one more um, information about this piece, or maybe it, is it also maybe easier to do it on a different piece. What about uh, pictures? Because uh, at least what I heard, there were qualities, not just you know um, mm -hmm. pitches, but there were uh, harmonic qualities that somehow were some what you were talking about the foreground or the mm -hmm. background uh, or some kind of space. <laughs> and, uh, so the so maybe uh, the question about the organization of pitches and then the qualities of let's say intervals, chords, which also seem to be uh, in a special role okay. in this piece. Yeah. Uh, tell you the truth, I don't remember how I did it. Mm -hmm. 
But uh, I can certainly sort of tell you in more general terms. <coughs> First, I organised the orchestra so that, such that it produced certain sorts of sounds, like the use of the brass and the uh, horns and trumpet and the trump trumpets, then six and third tones. And also, um, I used register to defamiliarise. For instance, right at the beginning of the piece, I'm sure you would have heard two, you would have heard a sandy, very high sandy coming down. And they were played by two soprano trombones. So I tried to, to produce defamiliarisation. It's like taking a photo of you in your family and smiling, or standing on the top of Mount Everest and smiling. They're two different things. And so, uh, having added these pieces, these instruments to the ensemble, I wanted to have a certain sublime, not ridiculousness, but a, a certain sublime um, beyondness, shall we say, beyond the usual orchestral ensemble. Pitches, right, let's have a look at some pitches. Uh, first, uh, I don't think of pitches, I think of intervals. Yes? Uh, of course you can use you can you can start with pitches, you can start with anything you like. But not having perfect pitch, I choose to go with intervals. And I tend to use uh, if I've got a set of pitches, let's say, um, You understand that these are arbitrary. Uh, yes, and um, I can give this is this is not a chord. This is a reservoir of pitches, and I can divide this up in ways which I I can then manipulate. So clearly, if I want, I can take those three and those three, or again, I can take those three plus the top one of the next group. Now, this may seem overly primitive, but what I do with it is, uh, one, I use inversions, so that these individual parts were taken around each themselves. And secondly, uh, I produce automatic pitches by reason of taking these units, whatever they might be, and then um, transposing them individually. What I try to do with pitches, I try to create a storyline for myself, which allows me to enter into the spirit of what pitches want to do, without uh, vast overcalculation. So let's say um, it's clear that if I put the bottom one as it was before, the top one will transpose so that the top note is there. There. The total aggregate of pitches here is different because I have modified the interval which separates these two trichords. And that is one element of it. Well, okay. Uh, content of subchords. Two uh, rotation in, uh, inversion trying to maintain the quality of the intervals and three uh, interval uh, between tripods. This is something I first used in my fourth quartet, I think. There's an article in the Paul Zappert, the Mitzayla Mega Paul Zappert Schiffel, not by me, I have to say, which look at the sketches. What I did was I sketched out by hand all possible combinations uh, of rotations and interval between these things. And at the same time, there was, I think, in that fourth quartet, uh, a further complication, which was that these things uh, actually mutated. I'm not sure I can actually do that now, but it, it worked at the time, didn't it? Uh, 
Yes. So the bottom one might have been And the top one might be You see what I'm doing? That for each of these trichords, I am mutating the intervals of them. Uh, so that in this case, for instance, the distance between the C and the F sharp, the tritone, has been increased by a quarter tone. This A quarter sharp is a reduction in pitch, a lowering of pitch by a quarter tone. Um, this E flat is a reduction by a semitone. This one stays the same, and this one falls by a quarter tone. They're not, it's not a particularly happy choice of intervals, but um, you can see that there are various stages which can be numerically called up. And a computer's pretty good at doing that. Uh, you might say, um, basic form, uh, okay, let's do, let's do mutation. Basic form, then mutation one, mutation two, mutation three, mutation four. Sooner or later, these things pass through each other because, um, well, this one doesn't, but that, that would be falling and pass through there at some point. So I've got here mutated forms of various, in various sequence. Secondly, I've got the transpositional interval between the tricord. So let's say quarter tone here, semitone there, three quarter. This is really ridiculous, I'm sorry, I'm I'm making it all up as I go along. Whole tone there. So already we've got um, the mutated which mutated form we're going to use, and also we have which uh, interval is going to be used to create uh, a new six note concoction. And clearly here, this one is particularly consistent because I've kept the bottom note here always exactly the same. But it might well be in the course, okay, transpose lowest note. It might well be in the course of this piece that I choose not to have this C at the bottom of whatever process I'm mutating and uh, rotating around, but have it transposing according to some other principle altogether. So we find a sort of um, strange sort of uh, discoordinated syncopation in the degree of mutation, the distance between this and the basic form, and we also get uh, some sense of how we can use these things, because if I, all right, what, how shall I do this? Okay. I'm choosing, the order in which these notes come is not fixed. So I can choose to put notes together which belong to specific notes of these of this uh, hexachord, or I can choose to um, destroy this, the, the particular process shapes. So I'm putting notes together that seem to lie together. So then you get something which is layered, and the intervals on each of these layers 
more or less corresponding. Now, uh, I don't recall that I systematized this, but I do recall in the fourth quartet, I actually ended up with a whole chains of fourths and fifths by the use of certain sorts of mutations. So you might get, da, 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 da. and then I would use them in that form because that outrages people. And it's the fundamental idea of where all these chords come from. So depending on the, if you know my, my fourth quartet, uh, the, the whole of the first part of the second movement is entirely built upon these rotating mu mutations and how I choose to interpret them as linear formations or not, as the case may be. So that would help there, I think. Uh, may I just, uh, yeah. is it then correct for a bit, a bit from the fourth school for that, yeah. that when you were talking about the fifth, mm -hmm. that the idea of those chords come out of the idiomatics of the instrumentation in this case? So that's uh, because you know that's the tuning of the uh, uh, strings, mm -hmm. and then you create a kind of reservoir of uh, by these mutations, etc., etc., where you then choose. But the, somehow there is this, uh, again the um, uh, the reflection mm -hmm. of the instrument that gives you <laughs> that is also that has some kind of what is Abdruck, um, uh, some uh, you know some imprint, or imprint. Some imprint in the choice of the uh, or in, in the work with the, with the pictures is is uh, or it, am I going too far? I think you're going a bit too far actually. Um, <laughs> if you look at that movement, it's an extremely violent movement. The strings are awful. Strings are played all the time in the first part of that movement, and the what gives us a little bit of respite or rest is by bringing in or um, <coughs> filtering uh, certain sorts of shape which are easier to perceive than others. And I can do the opposite, of course. I could make things that which are completely unnatural in their, in their contour. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did, in fact. Mm -hmm. And um, I felt if the strings were playing all the time, with very minimal differences, I had to do something in the pitch domain which would at least give them some sort of guideline at particular points in the movement about what's important and what wasn't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, this is, might be also a question which is interesting uh, since uh, someone in the 19th, uh, I think you were working or you take the help of the computer with calculations mm -hmm. and so. Uh, and yesterday you said uh, it helps you because you don't have to make 100 pages. <laughs> well, you saw so, it with the rhythmic structures. Mm -hmm. um, I can start out with one line and I can apply, if I look at the ratio relationships of the measures, good, and I write the pulses in, how that modifies from layer to layer to layer um, will be different depending upon which order you use to apply these techniques. Um, for instance, if I start with leaving notes out at a certain point, when I come to apply the next procedure, those notes aren't there to apply the procedure to, so you jump them. And by the time you get down to the 10th or 11th layer, depending if that's what you want to do, you, you end up with a, a sort of desert-like emptiness, which just had odd notes and figurations in it. I wouldn't <coughs> normally do that. But the computer is good in that sense, in that it, uh, it's allowed me to create a, an instinct for what the application of these different processes to the same rhythmic model. Um, is able to produce at any given moment. Um, it's very pragmatic. Mm -hmm. And you're using, as far as I know, open music? No, 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 no. no. Anyway. Don't like open music. No. <laughs> it's Mickey Mouse. <laughs> 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 it's got too many little packages which you can do something with. Now, I use the new version of Patchwork, which won't work much longer, I fear, because Apple is changing its basic um, hardware system, and there was already that problem a couple of versions ago. And so maybe Patchwork's going out now because it won't be, re it won't be ported to 64-bit. But I find it very useful. Um, it's very similar to open music, but it doesn't deal with, what it does, it, it, it deals with lists in the same way as open music does. 
but it doesn't the it doesn't work with me with blocks. And I don't like blocks because I like to think what's in the blocks. Mm. And I like to make blocks out of individual things rather than chopping individual things out of blocks. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe uh, we, we decided or we said that we're gonna stop at uh, 5.30, that is somehow a little open, <laughs> but not too much. So I would uh, tend now to ask you for questions and uh, yes please. You said uh, the human voice can shock her, what, you, what did you mean by that? I don't know if I understood it correctly. I can't hear you because my, my ears yeah, sorry. are covered. Well, you said, if I acoustically understand you correctly, you said the human voice can shock us. Yes. What did you mean by that? Um, in that particular set of circumstances, um, the human voice can bring an erratic atmosphere, a mysterious sort of vibration into a piece, particularly when you're not expecting it, and you, you hear them singing just these three notes when nothing else is happening. I found that a wonderful way of working. So, you call this an iterative principle, and I would be interested if it can also apply another terminology, for example, like um, well, some kind of weak self similarity or scaling. Would that be also appropriate? Well, what I can or do, let me, let me just give you an example. Um, I'll have to use a bit of patchwork notation, I think. But, mm -hmm. uh, let's say I have number two. Yeah. Um, this model has has four uh, pieces of information. Right? What I'm doing here is saying this whatever is broken up into a group of two and two, mm -hmm. but the group of two and two is broken up into three. Now, what I haven't put at the beginning here is the duration for that. The duration for that is then calculated separately, which is why I sometimes get measures where things don't fit deliberately. So let's say at the beginning here, we've got a 3-8 three, a three measure, okay? Say there's a three beats. So um, that will give me one version of it, but if I, if I, if I replace the three by five, which, because this is calculated separately, for each measure, so I have the identity of the rhythmic structure, but I do not have its total duration, nor do I have the total duration, the, the duration of the internal things. All right, what I work with is um, high and low threshold random, so that I would say, okay. Oh, can't do that anymore. Sorry. Let's see, I've got that. That is the low threshold, this is the high threshold. I would then say what it means is that any value between 2 and 5 may occur there. Here, any value between 2 and 1 may occur there. And here, you see that I'm deviating from the 1, the lowest, mm -hmm. into, into um, higher zones. I find that whilst it, this, you may argue against this that it's, that it's too random, I don't think so because um, it, you, the, wh how you choose the upper and lower thresholds is sometimes quite important. If I put one there, then that one is always going to be one, no matter what happens. And this one here might be seven. And that wouldn't fit into a four measure. So, uh, I could make one like this, let's say, um, let's say I'll do here four, uh, two, one, one, two. That is a reflection of the upper and lower limits, and that would give me, a, um, let's say, on the first beat, and on the next two, it would give me the ratios of one, one, and two. Mm -hmm. 
And this works tremendously well. Um, I, I, I create whole reservoirs of things like this, of upper and lower limits. And uh, I create also the upper and lower limits on the number of notes that may be played in any given figure. So I could have easily made this one here a minus one. Well, I wouldn't go into the upper limits for it, but yeah. So one can make one can make um, rest values, minus values, so that rests occur at certain key points, probably, but not always. So I create this. I say. Um, do I say? How many notes are in this figure? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Note places. Um, these can be ordered separately. So I know I've got five or six different ways of expressing one beat or one note. And quite a few of eight or nine or ten notes. Uh, the density of these things in a given measure uh, is also in my recent work, uh, decided upon. So I might say, for three measures, for these, well, let's go, let's do um, three, four, two, five. Um, I would say, in this three measure, bring two figures. In this four measure, bring one. In this two, bring three. And in this five, four. So, um, two instantiations of this um, uh, library of approximations will be placed in this three measure. And in order to avoid very large uh, ratio problems, I create, um, I say, if this is a three measure, then if there's only one figure is three, uh, if, it's a t if there are two figures, it can be uh, two and one, one and two, uh, or five and six, or things like that. Um, so we know there's not going to be, actually, what am I doing here? Um, five and one. Yes. There's not going to be a very big irrational like 17 at a time or nine or something. They're going to fit into that measure and these cells that have been worked out by this system are then placed upon those particular places. So in this case, uh, if this was selected, the first two beats of a 3-8 measure would receive one cell, and the third beat would receive a different cell, each of which is then um, each of is calculated with respect to these upper and lower threshold values. I hope that's understandable. Mm -hmm. um, of the algorithms you describe are uh, very um, deterministic. And on the other hand, um, you mentioned um, uh, the random walk uh, in the beginning of the talk. What, um, what is that relationship between deterministic and classic patterns in the competition process? Well, I, random walks are of different sorts. Um, I always make sure that at the outset, uh, let, let, me pick, let me make a table. If the length of the measure is two, then the program will choose either two or three as the length of the next measure. Yes? 
Let me do that. So two, okay. Randomly it will come out as two. Uh, now we still have two, so next time we will evaluate it. Well, let's say we take the three. Uh, then we're here, and it chooses one of these two. Mm. We're still back at three, and so we come in as two. So what I do is um, I make it more or less likely that certain values will iterate and certain will not. Because here I, I and down to here, um, I, use, I use mainly two and three, and there's no seven yet, so what do we do? Anyway, so we get two. Uh, there's no way we can really go on because um, <laughs> I have to put, well, yeah, I have to put four there, probably. Then you can get a four. <laughs> yeah, you see, improvised. So you get a series of measures which create um, diverse areas of likelihood and consistency. And um, I've always found that to be good. What you can also do is uh, after the event, you can scan for various typical combinations and do things with them. Um, for instance, uh, if by some happenstance there were three twos one after another, you could replace those three twos with something else. Um, something which doesn't belong in the system. So uh, I don't know if random walk is, is appropriate here, but um, normally, although I didn't do it very well now. Normally this works for me to intuitively balance how measures relate to each other throughout the piece. So it's not like just completely arbitrary, but it's uh, certain things will occur, will occur more than others. Um, just another one. This one, it reminds me in a way to, to a generative grammar, or it can also be non-deterministic by automatic. Uh, because you have these kind of rewrites, yeah, yes. the rewrite to... Oh, you can certainly do a rewrite, yes. Yeah, it's a rewrite system. In a way, and so my question is, because if you say you want to avoid maybe too many repetitions, if you have also like a hierarchy of rules mm. built in, so you use them or you do it on a, let's say, free choice basis, or you use also rewrites on a higher level. Oh, I choose this on a higher level. Yeah, and my last question here is if... Uh, this projects also this micro levels project on a formal level too. So uh, because you said in the beginning these uh, proportions were given to me. Yes, so they are I given by the system. <coughs> okay, so this uh -huh. and the overall formal development is also given by this kind of rewrite. Correct. Oh, so okay. I can't change them. Mm -hmm. I can rewrite parts of them. Yeah. If if I so choose, I have a little reservoir of rewrite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But for instance, um, if three twos came one after another, I could say replace them with five sixteen, seven sixteen, and nine sixteen, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that would be used as a consistent thing. I do. It's not very satisfactory, but we can do it. Um, I have for performance exactly. So when I played the music and all these kind of pieces, so you have the vision and the pitch, but then you have the dynamics and the articulation. Yeah. And it's with the dynamics and the articulation that I start to understand the gesture and what you meant with it. So how do you decide what is bellissimo and where you put this for fun? Well, one thing I don't do is try to organize dynamics. I think um, instruments are so various, registers are so various. The type of interpretation you subject different layers to. Uh, doesn't enable you to use dynamics in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. So I use, I, I do them pragmatically, always. Do you know everything about Brian Fernandez? <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? No, you, you know that I'm not now. <laughs> Well, so then we ended up at 5.30. Mm -hmm. Just uh, so that the given measure in line was really <laughs> fitted, so you can clearly do that. It's not a problem, we don't put in more time. We, had a, we had a little talk before this session. <laughs> this was, I'm afraid. Okay.
Um, just pragmatic wise <coughs> for those who are interested, I think at six, uh, if I'm correct, please correct me if I'm wrong. There is an open rehearsal yeah. of uh, Ensemble Schallfeld uh, rehearsing uh, uh, La Chute du Car, um, at from I think from six to somewhat eight. Tomorrow yeah. there are right. master classes again, and in the after no, there is class rehearsal before. Yes. Yeah. And then we have master classes as well. Mm -hmm. And I all invite you, and I hope you will all come uh, and uh, listen to what our students and the Ensemble Schallfeld, so the former students of PPCM, are doing tomorrow at the concert. We have, uh, as you maybe know, five mm -hmm. pieces, two ensemble pieces, a trio, and two solo pieces, Cassandra and the Time and Motion Study for bass clarinet. So it's somehow also a show off for the musicians and of course this wonderful music. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank, thank you, you for coming here. Thank you. And thank you.